And joining us now, Dr. Keith Martin. He is the Liberal MP from the British Columbia riding of Esquimalt, Juan de Fuca, and it's nice to have you in that chair. Thank you, Steve. Finally. Yeah, you've been on this program a number of times, but always on satellite, and we're happy to have you here this time. We're talking pot today. Uh, Canadians, I'm told, consume more marijuana per capita than any other industrialized country in the world. Do you know why? I don't, but about 1.5 million do, and why would you mm -hmm. want to criminalize those, those folks? And that's the situation we have right now today, Steve. Possession of a small amount of pot remains illegal in this country. Why has that not been effective in reducing consumption? Because prohibition doesn't work, and we're seeing the effects of that. The more extreme example is south of the border, where we have prohibition, whether it was back in the, in the earlier part of the last century or today, people actually it has no effect whatsoever on reducing use, reducing harm, reducing crime. In fact, the opposite occurs. What we're seeing is in, in conditions of prohibition, you have more use, more harm, more cost to the taxpayer. It's a lose-lose situation. I know what your position is on this, and I want to read a quote now from a special committee on illegal drugs that was uh, chaired by a um, senator named Pierre-Claude Nolan back in 2002. So this is several years ago. Here's what he said. Scientific evidence overwhelmingly indicates that cannabis is substantially less harmful than alcohol and should be treated not as a criminal issue but as a social and public health issue. Indeed, domestic and international experts and Canadians from every walk of life told us loud and clear that we should not be imposing criminal records on users or unduly prohibiting personal use of cannabis. At the same time, make no mistake, we're not endorsing cannabis use for recreational consumption, but we have come to the conclusion that, as a drug, it should be regulated by the state, much as we do for wine and beer, hence our preference for legalization over decriminalization. Now, that's not your position. You're only for decriminalization, not legalization. Why not go that extra step? I think we have to, to go and, and do what we, what's doable. I live in the world of what's doable in politics, uh, Stephen. And being a physician, I, I'm opposed to people using marijuana. It does have harmful effects. But Senator Nolan is, is correct. When you compare marijuana to alcohol, I, an emergency, I've never seen anybody come in who have smoked uh, joints and have been a problem, but I've had a lot of people who have drunk alcohol to excess and even kill people. So there is a difference. And in fact, the Canadian Medical Association said we should decriminalize marijuana. Uh, there have been police officers here and in the States that said change the laws. But what we have to do is what is doable. And if we legalized marijuana in our country, the problem for us versus in Europe, for example, is that we sit right beside a country with 300 million people. And there, for the most part, it's illegal. And if we do that, the problem for us is that we could become a hive of production more organized crime than is already here could come to Canada, which could cause obviously a lot of problems. So if we decriminalize it, and 68% of the public is in favor of decriminalizing marijuana, that's something that's doable, it will reduce harm, and my bill has one other aspect. People would also be decriminalized for having two plants in their possession. And what that would do is would sever the tie between the casual user and organized crime. Because organized crime are the real parasites that are profiteering over the status quo. They're the only ones who are generating money, and they use those monies for other illegal activities. But the thinking is two plants, you're obviously not a trafficker. You're somebody who's just using it for personal use. That's right. And that's the objective, is to, just to separate out those people who are casual users from the commercial grow ops that are attached to organized crime. And in many cases, we found that more than 50% of the monies that are derived from uh, the organized crime uh, uh, groups get, they get from drugs. Let's just make sure we're all on the same page using terminology. Decriminalization versus legalization. What's the difference? In legalization, you can, it's, it's legal, so you can do what you want. In decriminalization, Steve, it's treated as a, a fine. It's still, it's, uh, it's something that you receive a fine for rather than uh, going through the courts and getting a criminal record. So it's and like imagine, a parking ticket? It's like a parking ticket. So you get a fine rather than uh, going through the courts expensively. And right now, every year in Canada, 15,000 people are uh, prosecuted for simple possession. And why should some kid, 18, 19, 20 years old, with possession of a small amount of marijuana, have a criminal record, go to court, the costs are extensive, and it only harms the, the individual uh, and it doesn't really serve the public interest at all. So even as I said, the Canadian Medical Association, uh, the Council of Churches came out at one time and said that uh, the prohibition for marijuana possession causes more harm, and so let's decriminalize it. But you yourself as a medical doctor know that the use of cannabis, particularly I would imagine in teenagers whose brains are still evolving, 
causes physical harm. Doesn't the state have an interest in trying to you know, keep that from happening as much as possible? Indeed it does, and that's why I'm very clear to say marijuana is harmful to you. Uh, it does have effects on your brain, on your lungs, uh, but smoking, in fact, is even more harmful. Smoking, smoking tobacco. tobacco. Mm -hmm. And alcohol is, as Senator Nolan said, uh, is even more harmful. So it's a degree of, of harm. What we do know, though, is if the, the current situation where we've, where we've made simple marijuana possession illegal actually causes more harm to the individuals than decriminalizing it. In fact, if you decriminalize, they actually find that use, harm, crimes, cr um, criminal activity actually uh, decreases. Now, how do we know that? In Europe, they've uh, done that. In Portugal, for example, where they have uh, decriminalized an array of uh, formerly illegal substances. They found that drug use didn't go up, it declined. What they found is that harm decreased, crime decreased. And this bill has, a, has the added effect of really uh, being bad news for organized crime. It's going to damage and destroy the financial underpinnings of organized crime. And Paul Krugman, the Nobel laureate, I was asked, he said, if you want to go after organized crime, what do you do? And he said, the best way to go after organized crime is you destroy their markets, you destroy their financial underpinnings. So this bill is, is in part trying to not harm the individual, mm -hmm. but also it's, it's bad news for organized crime. Isn't there a danger in saying it worked in Europe, different people, different culture, different mores, different standards, different everything, and therefore we can use those facts and assume it will happen here as well just the same way? Well, we're not that different from, from Europe, I would argue, um, but we do know this. Punitive actions towards drug use have the actual opposite effect of what society wants. All of us want to reduce use, reduce harm, uh, reduce uh, incarceration rates. We want to decrease, the, and so what we want to do is actually not uh, being affected by the status quo. And I, I think we've got to get away from this war on drugs approach. We've got to ditch the ideology, follow the facts. So what I also hope happens, Steve, is that this bill can be used to open up drug policy in general. Invest in the money that will be saved from this, you can invest in Head Start programs for kids. Head Start programs reduce youth crime 60%, reduce drug use, saves the taxpayer $7 for every dollar we invest. Why don't we have a national Head Start program that bring parents and children together in the schools for two hours a week? That works, it's cheap. This would actually provide the resources to enable us to do that. And also in opening up drug policy, why doesn't every community in Canada have a drug substitution program for narcotics. In British Columbia, in Vancouver, we have the Naomi Project. What that was is a drug substitution program for narcotic users. What happened in that program, crime plummeted. Those people, by being given a narcotic, instead of having to go out and commit crimes uh, to raise money for their heroin addiction, they came under the care of the medical uh, family. They received a narcotic. They didn't have to commit crimes. They got back with their families. They were able to get back to work. It's a huge win-win situation. And now it's been expanded to the Salome Project, which is a long-term uh, <coughs> narcotic substitution program. I have heard, though, some people describe marijuana as a so-called gateway drug. It's the thing that kids start with when they're teenagers, and you start with that, and then you lead to something else and something else, and, and you move your way along to cocaine and then ecstasy. And do you believe that that's the case? Well, uh, the facts are is that it's not the case. And there, there's a fear that that happens, but the reality of it is that it doesn't. There's absolutely zero evidence that that occurs. If it was the case, then 1.5 million Canadians right now would be advanced into, into uh, other drugs. And in fact, kids experiment with things. A uh, very small number of those individuals actually wind up, obviously, being, uh, being um, um, uh, crystal meth users, coke mm -hmm. users, heroin users. It's a separate issue. Okay. What's the status of your bill today? The bill sits in the House of Commons. Uh, it's created a, a stir, and, and while my name sits somewhere in the middle of the, of the lineup and realistically won't move forward, I hope that it creates, uh, by being on shows like yours and educating the public, that I think it hopefully will create a wellspring of support in the public so that our citizens can say, the status quo is not good. Let's make some changes. Let's ditch the ideology. Let's drop the war on drugs approach, and let's have a smart effective approach towards substance abuse that works, that's compassionate to the individual, that decreases crime, reduces harm, and saves the taxpayer money. One of the things I'm not sure you've mentioned is whether or not decriminalizing would actually decrease usage. Do you think it would? 
From what we've seen in Europe, it, it does. It decreases usage. Well, isn't of, that against common sense? I mean, if you decriminalize, wouldn't it be sort of more enticing to use it? Well, it's an intriguing question, isn't it? And you would normally think so. But um, what they found is it's the forbidden fruit syndrome. What is actually deemed to be illegal, people will move towards uh, using it a little bit more. But once you remove that <coughs> stigma, what they find is that there's actually uh, less use because there's no attraction to doing something that is that is, uh, that is uh, not, not seen to be fruit. not forbidden fruit, exactly. Hmm. Here's an excerpt from a piece you wrote in the Globe and Mail back in April. You said, decriminalization must lead to the burial of the ideology and lies that have clouded the facts around substance abuse and deprived our citizens of initiatives that will reduce use, crime, and harm. Okay, let's unpack that a bit. The burial of ideology and lies. What are you referring to there? The ideology is that the war on drugs approach works, that the more punitive we get is somehow going to convince people to uh, not use drugs. And as one of my colleagues from uh, another party said in the House in a debate we were having, he said, people should just shrug off their addictions. Well, you don't just shrug off an, an addiction. Uh, addictions are, are complex. They're changes in, in the brain. So many, some people who believe that this war on drugs approach, that the tougher we get, lock them up, throw the book at them, is somehow going to convince people to stop using drugs or not take up drugs. That, the facts, prove that that's not the case. Usually in fact, a popular position on Election Day. Well, 68% I, I, of Canadians want us to decriminalize yeah, marijuana they don't possession. Vote. You know that. Those folks who are saying yes to that don't vote. Oh, the, no. the, the silent majority is not a big fan of drug use in this country. You've got to think that's nobody, right. Nobody is. And, and so yeah. why don't we do what I'm trying to do, and I think what more and more Canadians recognize, is that if the war on drugs approach is doing the opposite of what we want, if what we want and we do want is less use, less use by children, less drug use by all, less harm, less crime, less disease, that is, that is uh, 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 drug use can be a vector of that, particularly with uh, for IV use. Uh, if those are our goals, and they are our common goals, then why don't we do what works, and why are we pursuing something that actually do not only doesn't work, but actually makes the situation worse? What are the lies that you were referring to in that comment? The lies are that the, the, the war on drugs approach is somehow leading people to believe that the tougher we get with, uh, with substance abuse, the tougher we get on those who are using drugs, uh, the more we will actually be able to help society reduce use, reduce harm. Is that a lie or is that just a difference of opinion? The facts, and anybody who doesn't know that, uh, it would imply that it's a, would, would lead one to believe it's a lie because the facts are, are out there. And I would call it a lie. Somebody else may call it a difference of opinion. But if, if one wants to stick their head in the sand and not pursue the facts, and a lot of work's been done by some outstanding addiction uh, research physicians in Canada, Dr. Montana in, in Vancouver is one example, they've shown compelling um, uh, <coughs> factual, randomized, double-blind, tested uh, uh, experiments from Canada that can help not only our citizens, but the world. So why don't we follow the facts? They're there for all to see. A couple of minutes left here, a couple of minutes for a couple of real smart-ass questions. You ready? You, you can't champion a bill about marijuana use on Parliament Hill, um, probably without assuming somewhere along the way someone's going to ask you this. Do you smoke up? No, never. In fact, I, I hate smoking. Uh, I've never smoked in my life, and uh, um, I, can't stand the stand, I can't stand the smell uh, of smoke. So. Is there much dope use on Parliament Hill? I've never seen it. Really? Never seen it? Never seen it. Maybe. Certainly saw it when I was a kid, right? But I've never seen it. Maybe, maybe is that part of the problem? Maybe if more people smoked <laughs> up up there, then you'd have a few more champions for this bill? I take a collective Valium might be better so we can start <laughs> calming things down a little bit. I, I think it's, uh, people work long hours on the Hill. We, I generally work until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. My colleagues work uh, really long hours. I think all we want to do is to, is to crawl into bed at night, <laughs> get some okay. sleep. We'll leave it there. And, and, and you're not even, you didn't even do the Clinton thing, eh? No, no. I hate smoke. Never I mean, inhaled. I've never even smoked a cigarette. Puffed but didn't inhale. Didn't even smoke a cigarette. Nothing. Not a thing. Can't stand you're smoke. You're not curious at all about it? No. Uh, really? No. Can't stand it. That's my personal, that's just my personal position. So, but as a physician and having spent almost 14 years working in drug and alcohol detox units, I've seen the harm that the status quo, quo, the status quo causes. And, and I, it just it breaks my heart. I, I mean, I've seen people die. No, I hear you. I don't mean so to make light about it, but you've got to be the one guy in British Columbia who's never tried, you know, marijuana. There are others. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Martin, it's good of you to join us here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve.